Welcome to A Survivor's Guide to Help, where we challenge our listeners to take a closer look at the bright side of things. Negative news media can shape the world around you. Did you know that stories on crime and suicide are followed by an elevated crime and suicide rate? Between the politics, contention, and sensationalized stories, it's much easier to find bad news than good news. But at Survivor's Guide to Hell, we want to turn that around. Each week, we select a difficult topic, then use that theme to help you laugh, help you find a bright side, or even change your perspective for the better. We want to help improve your mood, your character, and your mental health with a healthy dose of silver linings. We're honored to have you as our guest. Today, our unpleasant topic is the feeling of not being good enough. The feeling I fear most, more than anger, sadness, or fear itself, is the feeling of not being good enough. A lot of people feel the same way. You've met them. You may have been flabbergasted by a lie someone fed you when they could have simply admitted a flaw. You may have seen someone make a mistake in their sport, in their car, or on an assignment, and hear them explain all the reasons the situation was out of their control rather than accept that they made an error. What about you? Have you ever gotten into an argument only to realize hours later, days later, or years later that you should have taken responsibility rather than argue your own innocence? I have. All of the above, it does not feel good to finally come face to face with the ugly truth that somehow, somewhere, you just weren't good enough. A few weeks ago, I posted on the Survivor's Guide to Health Facebook page, apologizing that episodes were not coming out as regularly as promised due to, quote, unforeseen events. Here's what really happened. I enrolled in a technical college and was losing a huge part of my day that usually granted some podcasting time. The massive shift in my schedule, however, wasn't the real reason I wasn't pumping out episodes in time. The real reason was that I didn't have the talent, the scheduling skills, or maybe even the grit that was needed to handle tech school and stay on top of my podcast game. In other words, I just wasn't good enough. This was not easy for me to come to grips with. However, it wasn't the end of the world. It's not even the end of the podcast. After all, you are still here listening to it. In reality, something magical happens to those who refuse to believe this not good enough thing is a permanent condition. That magic starts to weave its glitter and rainbows the moment someone can accept the idea that they failed. Only then can they assess what went wrong and change it. That beautiful sparkling failure is what this episode is all about. Two stories where the not good enough turned their shortcomings into their strong points. To ice our self-confidence cake, we'll give you a few pointers on what you can do when you're not feeling up to par. Let's go! Part 1. Sorry kid, you're not smart enough to borrow this book. It was second grade. I sat in a little plastic chair at a big round table, surrounded by other students resting their elbows on the table's wood grain print. There were a few of these tables, and our teacher was weaving through them with a stack of papers rustling between her fingers. She was handing out our first test of the year. I received my sheet and looked at the contents. Just like I'd seen so many times before, this paper was numbered down the left side, with a blank line next to each number. It was a spelling test. Drat. I was mildly panicked. We hadn't even practiced any words yet. How could we be expected to correctly spell what we hadn't learned? The teacher answered my unspoken question. We will now be establishing your reading levels, she explained. The amount of words you spell correctly will determine what reading level you'll be in for the rest of the school year. The teacher spent the next 10 minutes or so reading off a word, pausing, and repeating the word one more time before moving to the next. House. 
house. Another. Another. I did my best to spell the words phonetically. By the time the teacher had finished reading and began to give us the correct answers, my hopes sank. One word after another, my self-assurance deflated. I was getting them wrong. Almost all of them. If you got seven words or more correct, the teacher continued, you're in the green reading group this year. Good job. If you got between four and seven, you're in the orange group. If you got four words or less, you will be in the blue group. I looked at my paper with resignation. Blue group it was. We were shuffled from our seats so that we were sharing our table only with other members of our color group. At first, it felt unfair. Of course I'd done poorly. We'd never practiced these words. However, when my eyes lifted and I spotted the table with the green kids, I realized that they hadn't practiced the words either. Yet there they were, high scores and all. In my mind, they were a group of geniuses. But me? It was simple. I just wasn't smart enough. My disappointment subsided quickly as the day moved on and the spelling test was forgotten. I did well with the other school activities, and after a few days passed, it was finally library day. I enjoyed library day in my previous school. Outside of recess, it wasn't often we were set loose like that with hundreds of choices to make and no one to tell us that one was better than the other. I wandered contentedly through the long squatting shelves running my fingers over the book spines until I spotted my prize. I don't recall what the book was called or what the cover art was, but I eagerly brought it to the librarian to check out. What color is your reading level? The woman asked politely. Blue, I said. She flipped open the front cover and pointed to an orange sticker on the inner cover. I'm sorry, it looks like this book is above your reading level. Why don't you find something you like with a blue sticker? In that moment, I experienced a feeling that my seven-year-old self never had. It was cold, dark, and a little spiny. Above all, it was bulky. It filled my entire stomach. As an adult, I now know that that feeling was a miserable little mixture of resentment and disappointment. I had flipped through the pages of this book and tasted its words in my mind. I wanted to read it. But according to the score on my first spelling test, I just wasn't good enough for a book like this. I didn't argue with the librarian. I placed the book on the return shelf, then searched for something decent with a blue sticker. Turns out, the pickings were slim for us blue kids. As the weeks passed, I would repeat the mistake each time I found a book I was too excited about to check the reading level. The third time this happened, the stakes were even higher. I'd found a novel with a horse on the cover, and I loved horses. It was a beautiful little book, thicker than most of the others in the selection. An elegant dark steed reared on the front, its mane curling behind it like a flag in the wind. The title? Black Beauty. I opened the book, read its 1800s English, and fell in love. As I'd done twice before, I took my book to the librarian for checkout. And as she'd done twice before, the librarian asked me to find a book in my reading level. This time, however, my teacher overheard. One moment, she told the librarian. Let's see how she does. My teacher led me to a reading table near the edge of the library room and sat next to me. She flipped the book to a random place and put her slender young finger on the last paragraph of the page. Can you read this for me? I nodded, my eyes falling to the ink as I silently read the passage. Out loud, she added. Timidly, I read the words that Black Beauty was trying to speak to me. I must not forget to mention one part of my training, which I have always considered a very great advantage. My master sent me for a fortnight to a neighboring farmer's- That's enough, the teacher said before I could finish the paragraph. She walked me back to the checkout counter and set the book down. This student doesn't have a problem with this book, she said. The librarian took Black Beauty, this forbidden novel of untold stories, scanned it, and handed it to me. 
Taking it out of the library felt like sneaking a sacred artifact out of an Indiana Jones-style booby-trapped temple. I eagerly took it back to my desk and proceeded to devour the words. As I read it over the next week or two, it was mostly with wide eyes, sometimes with teary ones. I was never told I couldn't check out a book again. Not even when I moved schools once more and discovered a series of animal encyclopedias that were only allowed to be loaned to teachers. After the librarian had seen me huddled on the ground for the umpteenth time, back to the bookshelf with an encyclopedia clutched in front of my greedy eyes, she let me take the books home. My spelling tests improved the more I read, rather than the other way around. It was still rare for me to get a perfect score. I never became a spelling master, but I did become a writer. By mid-elementary school, writing stories was my favorite thing to do, with reading stories in close second. The stories I created became longer as I finished elementary school, progressed through junior high, and plugged away at high school. It was then that I started my first real novel. This was also when it was time to start thinking about college, which meant that the ACT was right around the corner. I didn't prepare much. I had no idea how to study for an ACT exam, so when I entered the deadly quiet testing room, I was only equipped with what I could remember from class and homework assignments. I stumbled, tripped, and bruised myself through the math and science sections. I moved comfortably through the English section and felt well at ease in the reading section. By the time the test was through, I was just glad I was fast enough to answer all the questions. When I finally received my scores, most of them came as no surprise. I hovered around average in math and science. I did well with English. The biggest shock came, however, when I looked at the reading comprehension score. According to this paper, I was in the 98th percentile. The ACT is administered in countries all over the world, with nearly 2 million students taking it each year. When it came to reading, I had scored higher than 98% of them. A lot has happened since I took the ACT, but I still devour books as fast as I can, and I still write them as well. I still struggle with math and have a hard time remembering the small details that make up subjects like biology and history. For all my reading and writing accomplishments, I still haven't published America's Next Great Novel or won any Nobel Prizes for my astounding storytelling technique. There are plenty of days, I still feel like I'm just not good enough. During times like those, it helps me to remember second grade, when I was told my reading ability was too low to check out a book. If I've traveled that far from there, who knows where my failures could take me from here. Part 2. How a Reject Artist Sold a Painting for $110 million. For our next story, I want you to picture Paris. Not just any Paris, but an 1850s Paris, where women moved about the city in swollen dresses that dripped in lace and bows, and men like Napoleon III strove to build France into a veritable empire. Paris was the leading center of arts, fashion, and commerce, and it was at this time that a man named Oscar Cloud packed his paintbrushes, bid farewell to his humble Normandy, and decided to move. Oscar was a natural painter. He enjoyed doing his work outdoors and had made quite a reputation for himself in the town where he was raised. Now, as one of Paris's newest residents, his sights were much higher than a meager local fame. Oscar had moved to the epicenter of elite artists, just miles from what may have been the most prestigious art exhibition of its time, the Paris Salon. The Salon was a big deal, a very big deal. The Paris Salon was the French Academy of Arts' official art exhibition and was an incredibly competitive arena for an artist to display their work in. Art was selected for the Salon by an elite jury of academics. In other words, it was up to this group of judges to determine what was good art and what was bad art, and their opinions shaped the trends of the entire world. The jury's tastes were narrow heavily favoring realism that featured conservative subjects such as historical figures, scenes from mythology, and attractive pale women with demure stares and massive dresses. The Salon jury considered it their mission to find potential in budding artists and nurture it to blooming. 
To them, however, potential was hard to come by. The upscale exhibition was held in the famous Louvre Art Museum, where the accepted paintings blanketed virtually any surface of the wall they could fit on. The paintings that the jury deemed to be the best were hung around eye level, while the lesser submissions they had accepted were hung high on the wall, some nearly kissing the ceiling and leaving patrons to crane their necks to admire the work, if they thought it was worth the neck ache. Being accepted into the salon could make an artist's career. Rejections from the salon could break it. It was even reported that one artist killed himself after being rejected. Needless to say, it was no small accomplishment for Oscar Cloud to have his art accepted on his first attempt at the age of 24. Two paintings were accepted, in fact, one of his lover standing in a green dress, and another depicting a quiet scene at the beach. However, despite his speedy arrival into the upper circles of the art world, Oscar's victory was not long-lived. One critic said his art was more of an impression of a scene than a scene itself. Others criticized his work as looking unfinished. A full-length portrait of Oscar's lover would be published in the Salon in 1866, but not a single one of his works was accepted in 1867, 1869, or 1870. The Salon wanted realistic works of art that fit into an exclusive cluster of themes, and Oscar's paintings, with their emphasis on light and form rather than replicating reality, were simply too unusual to be considered elite. Despite the artist's growing poverty at this time, Oscar was creating something more than paintings. He was creating a family. By 1867, his model, lover, and future wife was now carrying their son inside her. The financial straits Oscar struggled with took on a newer, uglier form. The man was no longer responsible only for himself, but for his companion and their new child. Oscar's father, who did not approve of his decision to make a career as an artist, nor of impregnating his lover, cut off Oscar's financial aid. The young family cascaded deeper into poverty. Oscar Cloud was struggling. He was known to get frustrated with his paintings, tear them apart, then sink into a soup of depression and self-doubt. The salon scorned him, critics seethed at him, his family was fighting just to create a livable existence. Even his brief brushes with glory at the Paris Salon were marred by criticism, so much so that one of his pieces was removed from its place on the wall and put in the back room, dedicated to rejected works. It would seem that at nearly every level, Oscar Cloud was not good enough, and he could feel it. At the very least, he still had his friends. Oscar would frequently meet with his fellow artists at the Café Gerbois, where the salon often floated to the top of the conversation. It turns out that Oscar wasn't the only one being rejected, and soon a passionate idea began to stir. What if Oscar and his companions held their own salon? After enough café meetings and an argument or two, the artists finally committed to the idea. This time, it was their turn to scorn as they threw the salon's rules, politics, and general snobbery into Paris's gutters. In 1874, the men set up a collective, rented a space, filled it with 165 works of art, and charged a single franc for visitors to observe their displays. No jury, no elite. Just the kind of art that they actually wanted to paint. 3,500 people attended. It wasn't the same magnitude as the Paris Salon, but it accomplished two things. One, it earned the starving artists about 3,500 francs, which was a handsome sum of money, and two, it placed them in the public eye. When these artists discarded the rules of France's academics and created their own home field advantage, something incredible happened. They began to be appreciated. Criticism was still definitely apparent, but this time, so was praise. The artists who hosted the show, who had now adopted the title Impressionists, were demanding to be reckoned with, and they were making a place in the world without any help from the Paris Salon. The success of the renegade art show greased the wheels of Oscar's career. During the late 1880s, he finally achieved solid financial success and a name in the art world. As time passed, even after his death, 
his fame would only grow. However, since Oscar Claude was only his first and middle name, you probably won't hear it floating around art circles today. Instead, you may recognize this artist as Claude Monet. The Monet, whose painting of several haystacks recently sold for $110.7 million at auction, which for reference is more than the GDP of 151 countries, including Kenya, Puerto Rico, and Croatia. You may also recognize the names Pizarro and Renoir. These were some of the men who joined with Monet at the Jabois Café and displayed their pieces in the Renegade Art Show. For those of us that fail on occasion, aka the whole of the human race, it's always important to look inward and see what areas we can take responsibility for. In other words, we should never stop asking ourselves what we should change in order to be better people. However, Monet, Renoir, Pizarro, and many others who join the Rebel Art Show teach us a thought-provoking lesson. Sometimes, not being enough has nothing to do with how good we actually are. Sometimes, it simply means we're trying to be good at the wrong thing. Like a lifelong bowling champion trying his technique during a basketball game, or a master of chess fighting for victory over a round of shoots and ladders. Sometimes, not being good enough just means you're trying to follow the wrong set of rules. Part three, three tips for when you don't feel good enough. If you've been chafing under feelings of inadequacy, we've got your back. There's a few things you can do to ease those dismal feelings and become a better person at the same time. Don't worry, none of these tips are designed for prodigies and legends, just normal humans like you and me who want to improve. Tip number one, get gritty. To understand what grit is, let's talk about West Point Military Academy. West Point is a prestigious school with insanely high standards for success. To get into West Point, not only is it recommended you have a minimum 3.9 GPA and a 30 on your ACT, which is nearly 30% higher than the average score, by the way, but you'll also need a very special kind of nomination, like one from a United States Senator, or even the Vice President. Life at West Point includes a brutal six-week initiation designed to test the limits of new cadets. 3% of new cadets will drop out during this initiation, and once that is through, if you survived, a rigorous schedule of physical exercise, academic studies, and precious little sleep becomes the new norm for West Point students. Despite the immense efforts it takes simply to start studying at the academy, 15% of cadets will either transfer or drop out before graduation. Psychologist Angela Duckworth wanted to see what qualities were most likely to predict whether a student would endure all four years of the school and graduate successfully. Turns out, intelligence and physical ability were not the top predictors for whether a student would succeed. Instead, the number one quality successful students had was grit. In the academic sense, grit is defined as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. In other words, when life bore down on them, nearly crushing them under its weight, cadets with grit didn't fumble towards the exit. They stuck with what they chose to do until they damn well did it. If you want to build your own grit, here's a few tips. First, pursue interests and passions. Get out there and try different things until you discover something that engages your mind and spirit. Without passion, grit is not only harder to come by, but it may leave you asking, why am I sticking with this in the first place? Second, practice often. Grit is not about being amazing at something. It's about being amazing at practicing something. Avoid comparing yourself to others on a regular basis. Instead, compete against the person you were yesterday. Fourth, find the higher purpose in what you're doing. If you're trying to develop the grit to get through college, for example, simply thinking about that degree may leave you struggling. It could be helpful to consider what that degree will do to make the world a better place, or how your education might improve your family's culture and your children's opportunities. What's the big picture reason behind what you're doing? Fifth, 
Surround yourself with gritty people. If grit is your goal, then the norms of your gritty peers will become your own norms too. With grit, not being good enough doesn't have to be permanent. Tip number two, when you're not feeling good enough, focus on the bright side of yourself. If you feel like you're not good enough, perhaps it's time to focus on your own bright side. Make it your responsibility to notice the things about you that you've improved. This isn't just acknowledging huge achievements, congratulating yourself for making your bed two mornings in a row, or for putting less sugar in your coffee than usual, are more than worthy accomplishments to feel good about. Make a point to ponder previous successes you've had. What are some times you've surprised others or even yourself with how well you did something? Have you ever achieved something you're proud of, like a degree, an award, a job, or even just a clean microwave? If so, remember those things. It may help to write them down and review them. In addition to focusing on past and present successes, you can polish the bright sides of yourself until they absolutely shine by engaging in acts of kindness. One study showed that teenagers that completed acts of kindness experienced boosts of self-esteem, especially when those acts were directed at strangers. Of course, don't forget to be kind to your roommates and family members. They can also help remind you of what a badass you really are. Tip three, mindset, mindset, mindset. Closely related to a gritty mindset is a growth mindset. A growth mindset means that you believe your most basic abilities can be improved through dedication and hard work. That's what Carol Dweck, Growth Mindset's leading researcher, says. The opposite of a growth mindset is a fixed mindset. You can probably guess what that means that you believe your basic abilities are fixed right where they are and cannot be improved. If you're bad at something, it's because you're just fundamentally inadequate. Students with a growth mindset tend to perform better in school, participate in more advanced classes, and have a better attitude towards their mistakes. One experiment that measured activity in people's brains even discovered that growth-minded people's minds stayed active when they gave an incorrect answer to a question, whereas fixed-minded people's brain activity tended to dull as they tuned out their mistakes. If you want to get better at something you're bad at, a growth mindset is key. Simply learning about this mindset can get you pretty far. Students who are taught principles of a growth mindset tend to achieve better marks. Another simple step to developing a growth mindset is pushing yourself outside your comfort zone over a period of time and paying close attention to your progress. If you see yourself getting better after some hours of hard work, you're bound to become a bigger believer in your own potential. Remember, if you just don't feel good enough, you're not doomed to eternal failure. Like little PJ and her horrible spelling test, perhaps you just need a little time to show your true colors. Or, like Monet in the Paris Salon, perhaps you need to think outside the box, create your own playing field, and surround yourself with people who appreciate what you can do. If you're just bad at something, plain and simple, and would like to improve, some grit, growth mindset, and self-affirmation may just be your new recipe for success. Either way, you're probably much more capable than you think. That's the end of today's stories. Now we invite you to join us for our weekly Silver Liners Challenge, which is designed to be an easy, actionable step that you can take to help boost your week and help you survive hell. Here it is, the Silver Liners Challenge. Make it your responsibility to notice the things about you that you've improved. Feel free to share your experiences in the comments of our website, survivorsguidetohell.com, or on our Facebook page. If you would like to see the videos and pictures that often accompany our posts, check out our website at survivorsguidetohell.com, where you'll also find much more information, including our storytelling code of ethics. We're always looking for new silver linings to broadcast. If you have something to share, please visit our site and drop us a line. And remember, if you liked this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and other streaming platforms. When you subscribe, you no longer have to go searching for episodes. They'll be delivered right to the place you listen to your podcasts. Simply open the app or website that you use, find our podcast, and click the subscribe button. You'll also be helping to support us as we spread our good vibes. If you like Survivor's Guide to Hell and would like to contribute some fuel for our fire, then you're already on the right track. 
just listening is the best thing you can do. We'd also love to hear your feedback by getting your review on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Giving a review helps folks find us and helps us to know what we can do to give you a better show. Last but not least, our cheesy joke of the week. Two painters paint a house and hand the customer the bill. The customer notices that the men charged no money for the actual paint. The customer says, you guys did such a good job. Why aren't you charging me for the paint? The head painter looks at the man and says, don't worry about the paint. It's on the house. Thank you and have an excellent day. 